Awesome. Can I have your attention, please? Um, today, I have the extreme pleasure of introducing Dr. Rob Walker, Rob's professor of chemistry and biochemistry department at Montana State University. Before coming to Montana State, Rob spent 11 years on the faculty at the University of Maryland, moved to Bozeman in 2009. Rob has a bachelor BA from Dartmouth and a PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research focuses on structure, organization, and reactivity in liquid interfaces, and also on high temperature surface chemistry on product electrocatalytic and metal oxide surfaces. Rob also serves as the program director for Montana's Collaborative Material Science PhD program, and I've been fortunate enough to work with Rob in that capacity for two years. And uh, the successful start or launch of that program is due in no small part to Rob's efforts. So please welcome Rob Walker. Thanks, Jerry. And uh, this is Montana Tech, so please don't let the science background uh, get asleep or scare anybody off. Um, I spent probably half of my productive research life uh, over in Roberts Hall at Montana State, which is the home of the engineering department. And so I spent oh, probably about half, maybe even two thirds of my research life uh, working with chemical engineers and material scientists and mechanical engineers. And so uh, hopefully that comes through. Um, I do esoteric things and they ground me into things that are useful and they try to do things that are useful. I try to distract them with interesting questions that may not relate to anything meaningful that are still exciting. Um, I'm going to tell you today about a project uh, that has been uh, started in my research group probably about 10 years ago or so. And in getting ready to come out here, uh, Thinking back over 10 years worth of work, uh, there were a lot of threads that I could weave together to tell interesting, uh, you know, interesting and hopefully cohesive stories about uh, energy conversion um, and storage in high temperature devices, so particularly these with solid oxide fuel cells. And there, again, there are lots of threads uh, that have great, great detail, uh, very nuanced, and would probably only appeal to the real aficionados. Um, you know, having to do with heterogeneous surface catalysis and the interaction of electromagnetic radiation with multi. And then I thought, no, it's probably better. And in fact, Bev Hartline had instructed me, keep it general. It's a very, it's a, it's, it's a smart audience, um, but with a broad, broad background. And so I took a step back. And what I'd like to do today is a couple of things. One is, uh, I guess, provide a backdrop for this research, talk about some of the challenges and opportunities that we face as scientists and as engineers um, uh, dealing with the ever-growing demand for electrical power. And one way that we can meet, work to meet that demand, at least in part, is by using electrochemical conversion devices, so think batteries, think capacitors, in this case, it'll be fuel cells. So I'll introduce you to that technology. Um, Studying fuel cells, solid oxide fuel cells, has some challenges, and I'll um, find out what those are, and then how we've tried to overcome those challenges and learn something about the mechanisms that will convert something like natural gas or coal gas, right? So picture of CO and H2, or butane or hydrogen into products to electricity. Uh, and we'll get some we'll, we'll get to some science at the end, and then uh, then we're done. All right, so um, looking at, and we'll get here, right? So uh, looking at chemistry and hard to see places, understanding energy conversion to 1400 degrees Fahrenheit, um, explain what all that means as the talk goes through. Uh, it's being done, in, you know, it's the work being done in Bozeman, Montana, um, and I had the good fortune to collaborate with folks again in mechanical engineering, that's Stephen Sophie, and chemical engineering, that's Paul Gann as well. All right, this is So let's actually do this. Right. About energy. Um, according to Google, as of this morning, there were 7.2 billion people on this earth. Um, that number may have gone up a little bit since this morning. Uh, 2.4 billion of them, that's about a third, um, don't have access to commercial electricity. Um, so you know, those are all, you know, presumably these, you know, a large part of those people would like a reliable source of inexpensive electrical power. If they want to be on the grid or they want to have some way to power their cooking, power some lights, um, power some transportation. Um, fossil, you know, of the electricity that's out there, fossil fuels provide about 85% of the world's energy. It's 
affordable, it's abundant, um, and fossil fuels are likely to be utilized. It's easy, right? Ever since the Industrial Revolution, this enormous infrastructure has been built up to convert fossil fuels into electrical power. And so, if the large, if the fraction about 2.4 billion are going to uh, uh, people are going to are going to have electricity, chances are a lot of it's going to come from fossil fuels. Um, fossil fuels have their issues associated with them. Um, they are not terribly efficient uh, the way we use them now. Uh, they do put a lot of CO2 into the into the atmosphere, which may be cause for climate concern. It's also a, regula a regulated pollutant. Um, so from just a simple air quality standpoint, uh, you don't want you know, as much CO2 going in perhaps as, as it's going in now. Uh, currently, we're putting in, uh, this is a 2011 number, 28 gigatons uh, worth of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, 5.4 is coming from the US. Uh, I think China is the winner right now with about eight uh, gigatons of CO2 going into the atmosphere uh, annually. Um, again, CO2 is about to play a role in the force of climate change, it's the famous hockey stick curve. And you can see that you know, the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere you know, go skyrocketing up at the start of the Industrial Revolution, right there in the late 19th century. And the carbon emissions uh, also showing, you know, also show, also following the same trend, not, not, not surprisingly. If we're going to reduce not eliminate, but reduce the amount of CO2 going into the atmosphere. There are a whole bunch of ways we can do this, right? And you say, oh, wait a second, you know, we're, right, we're on it. Right? Because we can do wind, right? We can, uh, we can, you know, we can convert, you know, all of the wind is blowing outside right now into useful electrical energy. Good. Uh, how about hybrid cars? Uh, let's, try, you know, let's, let's all drive Priuses. Uh, let's replace all of the light bulbs in all of the world with, uh, you know, with, with efficient fluorescence. Uh, and you know, biofuels and other ones, uh, solar energy might be way around this. Um, so why can't we use any or all of these? And this is a pretty telling uh, view graph that uh, that I have, uh, came uh, you know, from the Energy Research Institute at Montana State. You know, if we're going to save a gigaton worth of carbon dioxide by hybrid vehicles alone, we would need to replace all of the cars in the world. With, with hybrid cars uh, getting 80 miles a gallon. So it puts all the cars in the world with automobiles getting four times the efficiency um, of, in terms of mileage right now. And that would save one out of those 28 gigatons. Uh, you can work your way through this too. Uh, you know, it, to save one gigaton or reduce by one gigaton the amount of CO2 going into the environment using just wind, uh, you know, we need to in, we, you know, we need to have 150 times the wind capacity in the U.S. right now that we currently have. So take the Judith Gap, take the you know, take the southern Minnesota, any place you see a wind farm, multiply that by 150, and you know maybe we're onto something here. Um, and you know each one of these potential solutions to reduce the amount of CO2 going in the atmosphere um, has some challenges to it. Um, so bottom line is we need some contribution from all solutions. Okay, there is no one single solution that's going to do it for us. And so at Montana State, we are um, active. We, uh, when I say we, I mean the royal we. We, as, as, as an institution, are active in a whole variety of, of, of strategies, technology development, to try and limit or reduce the amount of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. You can see so carbon capture, CO2 monitoring. Uh, we have a wind application center. Uh, there's a big bioenergy or biodiesel effort. What I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about high temperature electrochemistry. So this is the chemistry that's performed in solid oxide fuel cells. And this is a picture from our own lab of a microscope peering into a, solid, a functioning solid oxide fuel cell, trying to learn about the chemistry that converts fuel into electricity and you know, what works and when, when do things go bad. Right, so solid oxide fuel cells, what are they? Um, solid oxide fuel cells are these magical, wonderful, devices. Uh, they come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Um, they produce electricity. They will produce, depending on the fuel that goes in, they will produce products, so carbon dioxide, they'll produce water. Um, they come in you know, size as large as 250 kilowatts, so this is stacked by Siemens Westinghouse. It operated for 10,000 continuous hours, uh, powering a couple of small towns in the Netherlands uh, before it was decommissioned. Uh, this is a 50 watt unit from advanced materials, and then this is a two-watt uh, micro SO, solid oxide fuel cell or SOFC uh, that was just uh, produced, in, uh, produced, not commercially, but produced in Japan. Um, the solid oxide fuel cell has three ingredients to it. It has 
an anode, a cathode, and a solid oxide electrolyte, hence the name. And so uh, you can pick them up. They are not poisonous unless you chew on them. Um, these are functioning, or they would be uh, if they weren't chipped and cracked. Um, membrane electrode assemblies. And so there's a green top to them. And if you flip that green top over, you'll see a black bottom to it. Um, the green top and the black bottom are, yeah, there we go. Um, those are the anode and the cathode. And so a solid oxide fuel cell, there's an anode, typically nickel. Uh, the green color that you see on these things is nickel oxide. We reduce once we get up to temperature. So that is our anode. I think we have a cathode, which is a lanthanum staunch and manganate material. Um, so this is a, a, a brosdite. And then a solid oxide electrolyte. These are electrolyte supported cells. So that elect solid oxide is about eight, tenth, or eight tenths of a millimeter thick, um, what you've got there. In a solid oxide fuel cell, the start of the food chain uh, starts at the cathode, where molecular oxygen comes up to the cathode. It's reduced to make oxide anions. Those oxide anions diffuse through the solid oxide electrolyte to the anode, where they make fuel, shown here schematically as methane coming in. The oxides react with the, with the fuel coming in to produce carbon dioxide, water, maybe carbon monoxide if there's incomplete oxidation. And what comes out is electricity, drop, drop through a load, return to the cathode, reduces more oxygen. Um, all well and good. Uh, the challenge here is that the energy, the activation energy required for those oxides to diffuse through the solid oxide electrolyte is about 100 kilojoules per mole. And so that is on the, you know, that's on the order of a, bond, a chemical bond strength. And the power that these devices can produce, right, the amount of current that we can draw from these devices, is limited by how much oxide we can get through the electrolyte. Because if we can't get much oxide through the electrolyte, that, that's our charge carrier there, and we can't draw much current. If we can't draw much current, we're not going to make much power from these. So it's uh, not helpful. OK, that's why we have to work at high temperatures. In order to get sufficient oxide flux through the electrolyte, we need to work at temperatures of no, 650, 700, 800 degrees Celsius, and that's hot. Uh, and 760 degrees Celsius works out to about 1400 Fahrenheit. That's looking at chemistry at 1400 F. Um, the structures themselves, that, that green structure of the anode, actually it's a little hard to see here, but it's a porous microstructure. Um, so it is a microstructure. It's about 20 to 30 microns thick, uh, and it is has a volume. Uh, a free volume fraction about 20% or so, and that allows the fuel coming in to diffuse through the microstructure all the way through. And so chemistry can happen all the way through that 20 micron or 30 micron thick anode. Solid oxide fuel cells. They produce their energy electrochemically, like a battery. And so because there's no combustion, solid oxide fuel cells are remarkably clean. Relative to the highest efficiency diesel engines that are out there, okay, you have no NOx, you have no SOx, right? because there's no combustion, you're not burning it. Uh, electrical efficiency, in combined heating and power applications, in fact, these numbers uh, are a little higher now, you can get up to 75% efficiency. So of the energy available when you send in a fuel, 70% of it can get turned into useful electrical energy uh, in, in, in a solid oxide fuel cell. That's, that's about twice but what do you get in your high efficiency diesel engines? Um, and you, know, you hook up a battery and it doesn't make any sound. Fuel cells, there are no moving parts, there are no cylinders, there are no explosions, nothing's burning. Fuel cells are remarkably quiet as well. Uh, the only noise associated with a solid oxide fuel cell is the noise associated with the gas handling manifolds to deliver the fuel and the oxygen air usually to the device and to exhaust it out. The, the device itself makes no, it makes no sound. Okay, so uh, two types of membrane assemblies we're going to talk about. Uh, one is a solid, one is an electrolyte supported, where most of the structural support of the device is in the electrolyte, so that's here. Uh, the other types of devices, and I don't have one with me, but these are anode supported, where the anode, that porous anode structure, is the bears the mechanical strain of the device, uh, provides the mechanical support, and that is, you know, those are anode supported cells, and I'll point those out when we get there. These are electrochemical devices. These are electrochemical devices. They work at high temperatures. It is easy to tell when they are performing well. And it is easy to tell when they are performing poorly because we can perform electrochemical measures. We hook some wires up. We hook the wires to a potential staff. And you know, shown here are two types of electrical, electrochemical measurements we make. This is looking at the potential of the cells, so the voltage. 
as a function of the current that we're drawing. And so, you know, you want to draw 15 amps, well, initially, you know, 15 amps initially, you can be in a voltage of whatever the voltage is there. The scale, the scale's not there, but the same voltage of one volt. To draw 15, you have to draw in this case 15 milliamps. Over the course of time, as the cell degrades, maybe you have to, maybe you, maybe you only have a voltage, right? The oomph driving the current through the cell of half a volt to give you 15 milliamps. And given that power is a product of voltage times current, you know, if you take a hit in a factor of two, your voltage to provide the same current, you know, you're producing half the power. So, you know, this is an example. The cell starts the day out performing pretty well, and then at the end of the, you know, at the end of the, at the end of the day, or at the end of the run, which might be 100 hours, uh, it's performing poorly. Right? The electrochemistry tells us that. It tells us that unambiguously. We can also look at impedance measurements. And impedance is really a measure of just how much resistance uh, is the cell, the fuel cell provide, uh, how much resistance the cell is providing or, or you know raising uh, as we you know as, as as we continue to operate. And the short version, you know, the way to interpret this is that a small arc from where the blue line there across the intercept to where the blue line here would cross the intercept. You know, the smaller the arc, the lower the resistance to the cell, and so it's not putting a resistant element into the into the circuit. You get to a bigger arc, which is at the end of the run, um, and now the cell has more resistance, and this can arise from a variety of sources. Here's the problem. We know the cell is not doing well at the end, but at the end, at the end of at the end of the trial. We have no idea why. The electrochemical measurements tell us how easy or hard it is to shuffle electrons through, but it doesn't tell us why. It's why why the cell is, has has degraded. The description was 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 made to me once. It's like trying you know trying to understand what's going on inside the solid oxide fuel cell using just the electrochemistry. It's sort of like trying to understand how a car works when all you have available to you is a gas pedal and a speedometer. The car is doing well. The car is not doing so well. But the mechanism of what's driving the car uh, is completely you know, it's under the hood. You can't see it. And so the electrochemistry is informative, but it doesn't tell us about what's going on. So advantages of the electrochemistry, let's see, valuable measure of system performance, um, easy to perform. We have no idea for the me mechanisms, and um, the inferred mechanistic details are model dependent. All right, so the cell has, the, you know, the cell has, the cell has failed, right? It's sank, it's sank below a performance spec that you can no longer tolerate, so let's turn it off. Let's turn it off, let's cool it down, let's take it apart, let's provide a raft of ex situ measurements. So TEM, SEM, we can perform XPS measurements, right? All of these advanced analytical measurements we can perform on the cell. And so we, you know, this is what a pristine anode looks like in the scanning electron microscope. And then after we've taken it apart, we can look again and we see that the structure has changed a little bit. There are these little flakes that show up. And further analysis tells us those flakes are carbon. And so this was a cell that was running on methane. And we can, you know, and so after we've taken the cell apart, after it's crapped out, uh, we know that the carbon has begun to accumulate. We, we start to cook things up. Um, we can do some other measurements using X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy and say, oh, you know what? I bet what happened when the cell was starting to fail, it, the carbon was beginning to accumulate. The anode was beginning to delaminate from the, for, from the electrolyte. But you're drawing conclusions based on measurements made a day after you turn the cell off. You're doing these measurements. You're making these, 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 these inferences under conditions that are in no way, shape, or form similar to what the cell was actually experiencing at the time of failure. Okay. So these are very, and so you know, all of these advanced analytical techniques, it's great. They're molecular, material specific. Um, you can learn a lot, but you have to pull things apart, and you don't know what's happened from the time you stop drawing current to the time you actually do the measurement. So he, we have some challenges. This Dante-esque type photo is a functioning fuel cell. It's the orange glow back there is, is the furnace that surrounds it. And this uh, black circle there, uh, that's the anode. That's the green, the, you know, the green circle that you saw on the electrolyte. Um, to do measurements in situ or in operando, in operando I'm going to use to say in a device that's actually working under realistic conditions, uh, we have got some challenges, not the least of which is that these things are hot and we need to find some way to make molecularly or material specific measurements under conditions of extreme temperature, 
under extreme oxidizing or reducing conditions, okay, and distinctly non-equilibrium conditions. And so this is just a trace of the black body, uh, the black body radiation, so the glow that's coming off of here. And so as you go from 500 degrees Celsius up to 1,000 degrees Celsius, you can see that the black the amount of background light being emitted uh, by the you know by the device is, you know shoots up considerably, you know, by orders of magnitude. So our solution to this then is to use a technique known as vibrational Raman spectroscopy. So if you think about it, uh, you know, I think maybe people have, have, have done traditional FTIR measurements or infrared spectroscopy, learn, learn about how molecules and materials vibrate. Raman spectroscopy is related to that in a way that I'll, I'll explain in a moment. But Raman spectroscopy is going, we're going to use to look at the vibrational structure, how the materials are vibrating and learn about the materials that are there and the materials in there, how the materials evolve. Okay, so um, a brief digression, and this is really what uh, gets me super excited uh, because I'm a spectroscopist by training. So if you mentioned light uh, and molecules or materials, um, I have proven the ability to talk for six hours at a time about nothing but that. Um, I won't here. Um, so this is part of me stepping back. But I do want to, you know, to understand the measurements, I want to tell you a little bit about what Raman scattering is or Raman spectroscopy. How does it work and what can we see? Right? Because if you have some challenges, what's the chemistry occurring in these devices? What, um, you need to know what you're going to measure. Okay, so uh, let's take a step back for a second. Here's a sort of brief tutorial. Uh, all you need to know about Raman spectroscopy in five minutes or less. Raman spectroscopy, it starts with a laser. Um, and that laser is light. It's coming in with a certain frequency. And in this context, I want you to think of light as an oscillating electromagnetic field. The electric field points up, and then it points down, and it points up, and then it points down as the light propagates. And that light is going to interact with a molecule, just call it an AB molecule. It could be, you know, A, a and B could be the same thing, so like molecular nitrogen, or they could be different. It could be a polyatomic molecule. It could be a bulk material, so a uh, zirconia or a uh, titania. Or, but the light's interacting with that molecule, that material. Now, when the electric field is pointing up, the electrons in that molecule or the electrons in that material are going to get pushed up. And when the electric field is pointing down, the electrons are going to get pushed down. And so we are inducing a polarization in this molecule, an oscillating, time-dependent polarization, where the electrons are getting pushed up and the electrons are getting pushed down. And from general physics, from, from, from freshman physics, yeah. We, you know, you, we, we all learn uh, that accelerating charges emit light. And so we're accelerating them up, and then we're accelerating the charges down. Up and down. And, and that process of accelerating charged particles, we are generating light. Okay, so most of that light that we're generating comes off at the same frequency, the same wavelength as the light we send in. You think of the light, come, you can think of light comes in, and it scatters. And this is a process, and, and if it scatters at the same frequency or the same wavelength as what it came in at, then this is a process known as Rayleigh scattering. And this is why the sky is blue, because Rayleigh scattering gets more efficient as you go to shorter wavelengths. And so the you know, best we can do in terms of what we see is, is in terms of short wavelengths is blue light. And we see the blue light scattered off of the molecules in the atmosphere. That's, that's why the sky is blue. But if the light is sufficiently intense light that comes from a laser, and then you get to focus it, so it's really intense. Then what can happen is that that light can scatter off of the molecule and leave the molecule in an excited vibrational state. So what we are doing is we are transferring vibrational populations. So we have a bunch of molecules that are vibrating just a little bit, and then when the focused laser light comes in, those molecules find themselves vibrating a lot. Now conservation of energy says that if we have just taken some of the energy that light that was brought in with our light, and we deposit some of the molecule, some of it in the molecule, then the scattered light coming off is coming off at a different frequency or a different wavelength of the light we sent in. If we know the frequency of what we're sending in and we measure the frequency of what's coming out, we learn about the energy required to vibrationally excite molecules and materials. That's the technique. Not every vibration is Raman active, so we need, to, we need to ask ourselves, what can we see? And then, and at this point, I'll, I'll, I'll stop with the, I'll stop with the spectroscopy and get onto the good stuff. But it is important to know what we can see. 
there is such a thing known as a selection rule. And a selection rule emerges out of the, just the quantum nature of molecules. And selection rules say you can see something or you can't see something. Simple as that. And for a molecule to be Raman active, in order for this Raman effect, this transfer of vibrational energy to be, you know, to, to, to be allowed in a molecule, the polarizability has alpha. The electrons up and the electrons down. It has to change with the vibrational motion. So what do I mean by that? Um, think about well, think about carbon dioxide, right? Carbon dioxide, O C O O. Or sorry, O C O. It is it's a linear molecule, a tritonic molecule, and carbon dioxide carbon dioxide can vibrate in a couple of ways. It can bend right? so in this motion, and if it's bending like this, it'll have a certain polarization. And then at the other extreme of its motion, down here, it'll have a polarization. A polar, sorry, polarizability, right? It'll be, you know, it'll be easy or hard to, to polarize the electrons when I'm up like this, and it'll be easy or hard to polarize the electrons when I'm down like this. And that potential, or that, that, that change in polarizability as a function of vibration is symmetric. Because this molecule, this, 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 this arrangement of the atoms, it's indistinguishable from this vibration of the atoms. It's a symmetric vibration. It's a symmetric vibration. It goes up, it goes down, it looks exactly the same. <coughs> and what that means is that the slope at the equilibrium, the slope of this polarizability at the equilibrium position is equal to zero. So we can't see the bending motion in a Raman spectrum. Ah, but the symmetric stretch, where my oxygen are going out and they're coming in, and they're going out and they're coming in. At one extreme of that motion, okay, it's going to be easy or hard to polarize those electrons. At the other extreme of that motion, it's going to be either hard or easy to polarize the electrons. But those two extremes, this and that, are different. The polarizability is different between one extreme of the motion and the other extreme of the motion. And so there is a persistent slope to the polarizability as a function of the molecular motion. That one we can see. <laughs> and then the anti-symmetric stretch, where what's going out, what's going back in again. That also is symmetric, polarizability is symmetric with respect to the vibration, and that's also not allowed. Okay, so this tells us what we can see, at least in principle. In practice, this is what we can do. Here are three spectra. <coughs> These are three spectra. They are 10 second acquisitions. They are 10 second acquisitions from one of those one of those one of those anodes that's floating around here. At a temperature of 730 degrees Celsius, after we have started to send natural gas into a fuel cell. And before we send natural gas into the fuel cell, there's this is a this is intensity as a function of energy, vibrational energy, and there's really nobody home. And then we just you know, selected a couple for the sake of clarity, but a minute and a half in, another 10 second acquisition, and there's a you know there's this feature showing up, right at about 1570 wave numbers, and then you know of uh, whatever that is, 30 minutes in, that feature has grown up to, you know, that has, has has continued to increase in intensity, and this feature here is assigned to it arises from the formation of highly ordered graphite, so an infinite planar array of carbon, all sp2 hybridized, forming on this nickel anode. So when we see this feature here, we know we have this material starting to build up on our, on, on our anode, which is, which is in fact probably not good. Uh, we know that it's highly ordered graphite because if it were disordered graphite, sort of a jumbled mass, or if it were amorphous graphite, there'd be a different vibrational signature that we don't see. There'd be something showing up about 1,300 wave numbers and about 1,375. And again, there's really nobody home. So, Raman's going to Can we see something? Is that response strong or weak? Uh, you know, if we push things and we have a good, and we have a good, good scattering material, we have about two seconds temporal resolution. And you say, well, that's not really state of the art as far as charge transfer and you know bonds breaking, which happened on the order of picoseconds or femtoseconds or ten to the minus twelve seconds. Now, this is fairly pedestrian, but from a control standpoint. From a kinetic standpoint, from a, whoops, things are starting to go south on me, and so I need to make the fuel feed a little bit leaner, or I need to start drawing more current or draw less current, one to two second resolution is just fine. 
Um, we have spatial resolution because we're going to be using a microscope projector about one to two microns. So not only can, I, not only can we tell you, oh, you know what carbon is forming, but we can look here, we can look there, we can look somewhere else with one to two micron resolution and, and spatially resolve where the interesting stuff is happening. We can also correlate these measurements with electrochemistry. And so at the, start, at the start of the experiment here, there's a little bit of bouncing around because the gas pressure is changing the cell. But we have a certain voltage, that voltage, that voltage on the... Uh, Voltage under hydrogen is about one, in this case, negative one point, actually, humidified hydrogen. This is whatever it is, you know, negative 1.12, negative 1.13 volts here. Okay. And then we send in our methane, and we see that carbon signal, that's the blue trace, the carbon, this is just the intensity of that 1570 net. The intensity is starting to go up, and as the intensity goes up, the voltage drops. It drops down to a characteristic negative 1.3 volts. And so we can correlate, you know, what if the cell is telling us negative 1.3 volts, chances are we are accumulating carbon on the surface. You wouldn't have that mechanistic insight if you were just doing the electrochemistry, but because we can watch how the condition of the cell is evolving, the materials that are present, uh, we can begin to make these correlations. We can also watch how these responses change in time. We can load up one of these anodes with carbon, a coke, and then we can turn off the fuel. If we turn off the fuel uh, and just replace it with an argon feed, you say, okay, so it's fine. You know, it's not, not much is happening. But then we'll polarize the cell. There's no fuel going in, but in fact, we've built up a fuel reservoir, right? We've deposited carbon on the cell. We want to oxidize, electrochemically oxidize this carbon away. And so we will force the cell to generate some current. And the only way it can generate that current is to convert some of that solid carbon deposit into CO2 or CO. Okay, so we can do that, and there's our carbon, and then you know, three minutes, three and a half minutes later, that carbon is, is down appreciably. You know, by the time we're at 10 minutes, that carbon is mostly gone. This new little piece, this new little broad bump is starting to grow in, and it continues to grow in you know, up until about the 15-minute mark when we stop the experiment. This big broad bump is associated with nickel oxide, that green material that's the, that, you, that you see on top of the anode. And so because we are forcing the cell to continue to provide current, and we oxidize away all the carbon, the only thing that's left for the, cell, for the fuel cell to do is to cannibalize. It's cannibalize its own electron, it's cannibalize its own electron, right, and converts the nickel to the nickel oxide. While all this is happening, we can follow what the electrochemistry is doing. And so this is a plot of intensity of the, car of the graphite, of the carbon that's there, and that's the black trace, and then you see that it dies away. We can watch nickel oxide grow in, that's the green, so it just, you know, steps there and then steps again. All the while monitoring how much voltage must be applied to the cell in order to generate a constant current. And you see that as soon as the carbon goes away, the voltage jumps up significantly. We have to provide more. Right? We have to. We have to polarize. We have to put more polarization across the cell to continue to draw the same amount of current. And to, and when we put that voltage across the cell, that where's that current coming from? It's coming from the oxidation or the cannibalization of the nickel anode, which is not a good thing. Nickel, nickel oxide is not a conductor, it's not a catalyst. Uh, nickel oxide is about 40% bigger than nickel itself, and so you have tremendous mechanical or lattice expansion if you start to convert, which induces mechanical stress. So, yeah, so from a diagnostic standpoint, you know, we know that this steep jump in voltage corresponds to a, you know, the disappearance of the remaining electrochemically accessible carbon. And then if we keep going, uh, we're going to start to oxidize our nickel. Right, so um, what are we going to do? Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, you know, like the balance of the time to tell you about some interesting stories I think that have resulted. How can we actually perform these measurements? Um, what can we learn from this? So. We got into this business in part because a colleague of mine, um, a colleague of mine in mechanical engineering at Maryland said, hey, uh, you know, Rob, you study surfaces with spectroscopy, and we've got this Navy project, and so can you study the surface of these solid oxide fuel cells using spectroscopy? And being you know, fairly naive and younger, younger than I am now, and ambitious with some really talented graduate students, I said, sure, and how hard can it be? Um, and it was hard. Uh, and, and it was good that it was you know, five years worth of support because we failed spectacularly for the first three years. Um, I think this is probably in the fifth or sixth generation assembly. We tried all kinds of things to try and create a functioning device with optical access that wouldn't do things like melt 
the, the innards of microscope objectives that wouldn't cause windows to crack, that wouldn't spontaneously mix hydrogen on the fuel side and air on the cathode side uh, at a temperature of 800 degrees because that causes bad things to happen. Um, we melted stainless steel along the way at some point, and, and you know, just this is what we came up with. We call it rocket because it sort of looks like a rocket. We send in hydrogen and oxygen, and it sort of has cylindrical symmetry. Uh, it's a nested assembly here. It's a nested assembly. It's it's based around a one-inch diameter uh, aluminum tube. That's that's this thing here. So there it comes under there, and up the middle of that tube here comes our air, and it hits the cathode on the on this back side here. This disc here is that's those same discs that were floating around. We we seal those discs using a cement paste or silica silica cement uh, to the to the to the one-inch aluminum tube. So that gives us our atmospheric separation. Air comes up the you know, air comes up the middle, hits the cathode, and then it's exhausted up the bottom. Fuel comes up this small uh, quarter inch diameter tube on the outside, passes over the anode, there's the blow up there, and then it comes out and is exhausted up the bottom. And then we have a long working distance objective here that we drop into the throat of the high temperature furnace. The objective gets up to about 120 degrees Celsius, uh, but we have some rather elaborate cooling mechanisms, uh, cooling schemes that involve uh, lots of nitrogen, cool nitrogen flowing over the objective to, to, you know, to try and keep it from, you know, from the innards from melting. Um, and that microscope objective focuses the light, our laser light, onto the sample, and then we collect the scattered light coming back out. So we can collect the back scattered light coming back out, the microscope objective recolonates that light, sends it into a detector. So this is a great technique because this is a great technique because of the standoff detection. Right, our microscope objective is about a centimeter and a half away from the surface of the fuel cell. Um, we don't have to worry about this glow, right? This 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 infrared glow coming off because we're using visible light, so we, don't, we can avoid the black body effect. So again, spatial resolution of two microns, temporal resolution of about two seconds or so. Um, there are three places in the world where you can do measurements like this right now. Um, one is at Imperial College in London. Um, the other one is at the AIST, uh, Advanced Institute for Science and Technology in Japan. And then if you drive 75 miles that way, Bozeman, Montana is the other place where you can do this. So there are three places you can do these high temperature measurements in functioning electrochemical devices. Uh, so that's pretty fun. Uh, we are part of a team looking at optical diagnostics for SOFC, so we'll work closely with people at the University of Maryland who do ambient pressure XPS at the beam line at the Advanced Light Source of Berkeley. We work closely with folks at the Naval Research Lab who do near infrared imaging. I'll show you some of those images as we go through because those are helpful. Um, and all the while, we are trying to understand the chemistry so we can make you know, fundamental measurements, we can drive rational cell design. We can provide, this is work that's uh, come up in the office, it's supported by the US Navy, and so the fleet, the naval fleet, is very interested in these devices because they're quiet, they're efficient. And so we are going to provide performance characteristics uh, to the fleet and tell them how best to use their fuel and under what conditions. And so many stories to tell. Go to just touch upon two. Uh, these are, you can think of these really as vignettes. So I've told you about fuel cells, I've told you about how we can measure things in them, now what do we do with what do we do with this? Um, SOFC is operating with, with biogas. So biogas is, is a mixture of methane and carbon dioxide at 800 degrees Celsius. And then uh, how we can be quantitative with these measurements and what's up with the mechanisms of cell degradation and ultimately failure. And fuel mixtures. Um, if you've got some organic stuff, you know, food waste or, uh, or switchgrass or Deadfall kill, and you turn some bacteria loose on these, on, you know, on, on your organic matter. You'll get a number of things. You'll get methanol. You get some loss of ethanol. But in these anaerobic digesters, uh, one of the biggest, well, the gas phase product comes out is usually a mixture of methane and carbon dioxide. This is what's called. This is typically what's called biogas, and the composition will change. But but you know, whether it's 50-50 or 70-30, depending on the uh, uh, the, the source of the carbon and the, and the, and the microbes that you're using. But, so biogas studying CH4 and CO2, and you know, it comes out of digesters. Uh, this, is, you know, this is an example of, of a, a plant, a, a biodigester in a small town in southern Germany, uh, produces the entire, you know, the entire fuel uh, used by the town. So the town is 
effectively carbon neutral. Um, biogas in the landfill is about a 50-50 mix of carbon dioxide and water. Natural gas, you're somewhere up here. Biogas, um, you know, from a anaerobic digester plant is about 60-40 methane, methane to CO2. The chemistry is complicated with mixtures. You can imagine a whole bunch of different things happening in, uh, inside of your fuel cell. I, Methane and carbon dioxide tend not to react unless they're in the presence of a catalyst, but they can react. And if they react, then they can undergo reforming reactions to form carbon monoxide and hydrogen. That's what's in that. Um, if you're making carbon monoxide on a catalytic surface, that carbon monoxide can disproportionate back to make CO2 and solid carbon. Solid carbon is a bad actor. It blocks catalytic sites. It can poke up the porous network of your amp. You want to try to avoid carbon accumulation or coke formation if you can. Um, other things, methane, methane can fall, nickel is a great carbon hydrogen bond act, you know, activation catalyst, and so the methane can fall apart to make, you know, absorb carbon plus hydrogens. Uh, and then once you start polarizing the cell, those hydrogens can make this. Okay, so there was some glitches there. The hydrogen can, the hydrogen can react with the oxides to make water, that's a good thing. The adsorbed carbon can react, can react with oxides to make carbon dioxide, that's a good thing. Um, and it can also make, um, there should be a CO that's there, or use that. Okay, so what can we do with this? Here's rocket. Um, instead of doing Raman spectroscopy, first we just want to have a gross idea of the chemistry that's happening on the cell. And to do that, you know, working with folks at the Naval Research Lab, uh, instead of having this microscope projected, we just took a, a, a digital camera, silicon-based digital camera. And we put a long wavelength filter on the front of it. So it's filtering out all the 800 nanometer long wavelength filters. So all wavelengths, all visible wavelengths, are filtered out. And the cutoff for silicon is about 1.3 or 1.4 microns. And so we're collecting all of the infrared, near infrared light emission coming off the cell. And uh, with that, we can actually do some thermal imaging. We can look at what the temperature profile looks like across the across the device. We can do this with about 50 micron resolution. It's about, you know, when you take the imaging optics and you put them back onto the camera, the pixel density of the camera, we're about 50 microns picture resolution. When we send methane into the fuel cell, there's very little temperature change. So methane going to the fuel cell, this is all an open circuit voltage, so we're not the current yet. Uh, send methane in and nothing's really happening. When we send biogas in, right where the jet comes in, right there, there is tremendous cooling in the cell. And there is tremendous cooling, uh, you know, to the tune of about 15 degrees or so. You say, well, 15 degrees on top of, and this was, these were done at 800 degrees C, 15 degrees on top of 800, it doesn't seem like that much. But if you start to think about differential cooling, if you start to think about thermal coefficient expand, thermal coefficient expand of TCEs, uh, and the mechanical stresses that those will start to introduce on this sealed system, you start to worry about the effects that heterogeneous or asymmetric cooling will have on the mechanical integrity of the cell. Okay, so the infrared imaging tells the near infrared imaging tells us that we have thermal gradients when we put biogas in, not there with methane. Okay, what does that correspond to? What that that first, and here's just a reflection of that. This is a plot of the change in temperature as a function of time. The blue traces here are with biogas, the black and gray traces are with methane. When we send in biogas, then there's like 12 or 13 degrees cooling there, and it doesn't seem to be all that sensitive to whether or not we're working at open circuit voltage, that's the dark blue, or working with the cell polarized, drawing at about 75% of the total current the cell, the cell can pull out. Now that's the sort of the steel blue trace there. You know, in contrast, methane, there's not a lot of cooling, that's the black trace there, but once you polarize the cell, once you start to draw current, there is significant cooling that you can see. There's measurable cooling on the order of about a <coughs> And so polarizing the cell makes things a little more difficult. Um, what's this correspond to? Well, here we go. Um, this is a spectrum. This was a shown there. Uh, these that's that's a looks like a five second acquisition. Uh, when we're sending methane in, this is an open circuit voltage. Uh, we are seeing, and you know, that's what we're measuring with the microscope unit, that little asterisk right there. Uh, we see tremendous carbon showing up. That's that GP, of course, on the highly ordered carbon. This is going further out in the spectrum. This is an overtone. It's a spectroscopic uh, signature of a different aspects of the carbon structure. But we can see methane, we're coping things up. There's no temperature change, or no temperature change, uh, but we're forming significant amounts of carbon. Uh, with biogas, that's the blue trace here. Uh, there's really not much of anything. There might be a little bit of disordered carbon showing up right there, but not much. Uh, and then just the control with hydrogen, that's the that's the gold trace down there, and that's 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 what our background looks like. So cooling with biogas but no carbon accumulation. 
Uh, with methane, there's very little cooling, but there's significant carbon accumulation. Uh, we can do this at 800 degrees Celsius, 750, 700 degrees Celsius. And at 800 degrees Celsius, 750, we get about the same story. We actually have less carbon forming uh, at the lower temperature with methane. Still nothing showing up with the biogas. Once we get down to 700 degrees Celsius, so you know, relatively cool in, in, in this world of solid outside fuel cells, once we get down to 700 degrees Celsius, sometimes there's carbon that forms, and sometimes there's not. So there's this very uh, random fluctuation about whether carbon forms or whether carbon doesn't form. And we're working to try and correlate that then with thermal changes that we see in the thermal imaging. So, so there's some summaries there. And what we conclude, conclude from all of this is that with biogas, that, C, that methane, we're driving some chemistry, and there's, and there's some thermal chemistry behind this, but those temperature changes that we're getting correspond to the methane and the carbon dioxide perhaps forming solid carbon, but that solid carbon doesn't stick around very long because that solid carbon, if there's CO2 present, will, through boudoir chemistry, form carbon monoxide, which then desorbs from the surface. And when it desorbs from the surface, uh, this, this whole process here is very endothermic to the tune of two, three hundred kilojoules per mole at these temperatures. Uh, we think that's what's responsible for the cooling. Uh, we are forming carbon. We know that eventually because with biogas, once we turn off the fuel, we polarize the cell. The, polar, the, the, the voltage required to polarize the cell doesn't do very much. And then it goes to that inflection point, which corresponds to, we saw before, a loss of carbon. It's carbon we can't see, or maybe just a little bit of carbon that's there. If we do the same measurement with a cell that had been polarized, we see that that inflection point, that steep rise happens early, which says that we're forming less carbon when the cell is actually operated. And so in the last five minutes or so, I want to just um, uh, before taking the questions, if uh, we're scientists, we're engineers. It is incumbent upon us to be as quantitative as we can. Um, stories are good. Waving hands is, is nice. Back backs and envelopes are incredibly attractive places to sort of rough things out. But we want to be quantitative. We want to be able to say these are the exact or the, within we want you know stable operation can happen within this framework within you know this fuel flow within this current look with this polarization or drawing this amount of current. We want to be able to put numbers to these things. And so, can we benchmark? Can we graph? You know, can we determine exactly how much graphite has formed on the SOFC anode? Spectroscopy will tell you that it's there or that it ain't. But it won't tell you how much, at least not without doing a lot of background measurements, you know, back, you know background uh, foundational measurements, looking at standards that you don't control all that well anyway. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take one of these cells. We're going to benchmark the cell with hydrogen. You know, so this is volcanometry. Is a you know, so voltage is a function of current. With hydrogen going in, you start to draw more current, and the voltage goes down. And uh, power is this curved parabolic thing uh, that's just a product of each order pair along that voltage current trace. Good. Then we're going to expose our anode to methane at open circuit voltage. And we know that we're going to accumulate carbon, right? We can see it grow in. This is the trace we saw before. You know, initially there's no carbon home. We send natural gas or methane in and we start to form carbon. We can follow the kinetics of that carbon accumulation. Then we're going to turn off the fuel and we're going to polarize the cell. Just in the way I described earlier, we're going to say you're not getting any more fuel other than that coke that's deposited on you. But we're going to force you to provide 50% of the maximum available, the maximum current that you're that you're capable of doing. That's what we get from the benchmark measurements. And when that happens, we're going to watch the carbon signal go down. And so initially, there's a large carbon signal. Then that carbon signal gets smaller and smaller and smaller. That's the carbon signal. The red the red the red data there it falls off as the inflection one drops down. At the same time, we're measuring the potential. We're measuring the potential. The potential, as we're oxidizing that carbon, the potential rises gradually. Once the carbon goes away, that potential rises steeply. And we know, because we're in on it, uh, we know that that corresponds to, uh, coincides with the start of nickel oxide formation. OK, so we have some quantitative measurements. We have some spectroscopy. That's the red trace. We have some electrochemical data. That's the blue trace. That's good. Um, 
Let's take this inflection point, the electrochemical inflection point, right there, where we go through the, where we go through you know, positive curvature to negative curvature, right? There, about 200 seconds. Because we are controlling the current, we know exactly how much charge has passed through the cell at 200 seconds. Current is you know, amount of charge per unit time, you know the time, so we get the amount of current that's going through. And in fact, we know that at 210 seconds at that current, we have pulled you know, three, you know, three to the minus five moles worth of oxides through the cell. We also know what is coming out of the cell because we look at the exhaust. We measure the amount of carbon dioxide and the amount of carbon monoxide coming out of the cell, so we can account for our carbon balance. So then it's a matter of stoichiometry with the, with the amount of oxide that's gone through, the amount of carbon that's come out, and what we find out is that we begin to cannibalize, you know, the, the business part, we begin to cannibalize our electrode. We begin to use up all electrochemically accessible carbon. You know, when, you know, when yeah. of, the electrochemical, sorry, of the carbon that's there, two to the minus five moles were electrochemically accessible. That's the coke we put down, and that's the carbon that we re reoxidize back away. Okay, um, so we're going to stop because we don't want to kill our cell just yet. Flush everything out. We're going to benchmark our cell again with hydrogen and say, how did that carbon accumulation and removal cycle affect the performance of the cell? And, you know, if we stop this oxidation, if we, if we stop this, the experiment in time, then there's about a, anywhere from a 1 to 5% hit in power with each one of these cycles. And we can do this again and again and again. And each time we lose maybe one, two, three percent worth of power. Instead of stopping, once, our, once we instead of stopping the experiment as soon as we begin to oxidize our nickel, let's let the experiment go and let's go through that second inflection point. Again, that corresponded to the the the, the strong appearance of that nickel oxide band. There's that nickel oxide band. And those are the data again. Uh, the carbon uh, things to switch around. So the carbon disappears. We go through that first inflection point. So we start to oxidize our nickel. We go through that second inflection point. The nickel oxide signal really shoots up. And there's some mechanistic insight there. But what I want to do is how did that next step affect things? And so how did that step of that second inflection point, where we really start to see a lot of nickel oxide grow in the spectrum, how did that affect the performance? And the fact that it affected the performance catastrophically. Going from trial seven to trial eight, so that so it was trial seven was the one where we let where we really let the cell go as long as we wanted. And you can see that you know from one to seven there was this continuous loss of power going from you know, the top power initially to to the you know, what we were after seven, that would correspond to again, you know, sort of one or two or three or four percent loss per cycle. But then all of a sudden, in one fell swoop between you know, in trial seven, when we fully oxidized our anode, uh, we experienced a, a twofold hit in our cell in our cell performance, and we never ever get it back. So I think that's probably a good place to stop. You've been very patient. Uh, some of you continue to make eye contact, so I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> uh, over the past hour or so, uh, talked to, I've talked to, tried to put this research in a bit of context about the need to develop and employ more efficient, affordable, standalone sources of, electri of, of electrical power. Right? And solid oxide fuel cells are a good way to do that. Solid oxide fuel cells don't require that you be on the grid. It doesn't require the high voltage cables. And so you can think that if you are in a remote location, you know, whether that rem remote location is Vimo, or whether that rem remote location is a forward operating post somewhere in Afghanistan, if you can convert fuel efficiently into electricity, um, you're better off. And solid oxygen fuel cells are a good way to do that. Um, if you can understand the chemistry, the processes that convert fuel into electricity, um, you really need to be able to make direct measurements because the indirect measurements will hide a lot of the details and whatever mechanism you come up with to try and describe the process that takes fuel into electricity products, uh, there are always going to be questions. You will never know what exactly is going on. Um, no, sorry, that should be three and four. 
But the spectroscopy is by training. I love spectroscopy. The spectroscopy is not the answer. It's spectroscopy is only part of the answer because spectroscopy can tell us what's there or what's not there, but it doesn't tell us how the cells perform. We need to correlate the spectroscopy with the electrochemistry, with the thermal imaging. We need to take all of these pieces and bring them together to develop a consistent and cohesive mechanism to describe what can be some pretty complicated chemistry, right? So there was complicated chemistry just with carbon dioxide and methane. What happens now if you send in butanol or biodiesel? Now, the chemistry is going to get horrifically complicated. The mechanisms that can lead to degradation and failure, as well as electrochemical conversion, production of electricity, are you know, multiplied exponentially. Um, OK, so the optical spectroscopy doesn't tell the whole story. So I have the ability or the opportunity uh, to come here and talk about the work that is not done by me, uh, because I, uh, students get nervous when I go into lab now. Uh, I get to work with a great, great team of students. Uh, and here's, this is our current iteration uh, this year. So right now we are seven graduate students, uh, three undergraduates. Uh, I want to draw particular attention to a lot of this work was done by John Kirtley. That's this fellow right here. He will be graduating uh, in December of this year. He has an NRC postdoctoral fellowship. He'll actually be going to the Naval Research Lab for a couple of years um, and then and, and see where things go from there. Um, so John is a fifth year graduate student. Melissa McIntyre is a third year graduate student. That's her right there. She's got the asterisk because she is from Butte. Um, so uh, and she's a uh, physics major at MSU, and then she spent some time at the University of Montana and came back to graduate school, and, and she's she's great. Uh, Kyle Reaping and Dan Danny Luber are two other students um, who are there and there and there are newer students on this project. Uh, I get to work with Brian, Ar uh, Brian Eichhorn and Jeff Arutsky on this project, and Josie Hill up at uh, Brian's at Maryland, and Arutsky is at the Naval Research Lab, my conference there too. And those are longtime collaborators, they've been here from the beginning. Uh, more recently, we've started working with folks in Canada as part of their Canada SMFC program. Uh, we talk often with folks in the School of Mines and at the Danish Technical University. Again, the work is supported by the Office of Naval Research. And I want to close out by thanking all of you. If you've got questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Thanks. You mentioned that when you were developing the rocket, you failed miserably for three years. And you also talk about quantifying things. What was the dollar amount of stuff you destroyed failing miserably for three years? So I'm going to sort of sidestep that one uh, just, 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 just a bit. Um, and uh, sort of espouse more of the virtues of solid oxide fuel cells first. One reason with solid oxide fuel cells, another reason why they're very attractive, they're efficient, and they're clean, and all that. Uh, they're cheap, right? It's a bucket of sand, it's a, it's a bucket of sand to give you your solid oxide. Nickel is dirt cheap, and the cathode, the lanthanum strontium manganate, is also, is also cheap. And so, from a materials standpoint, uh, we actually didn't go through very much. The you know, when we, uh, when we, when we had a, when there was a hydrogen leak and we melted some stainless steel, we melted some stainless steel tubing. Um, the short answer is that there's, the short answer is that there's no good answer. I mean, any building project, you sort of figure is maybe five to ten thousand dollars to build something in house. Um, you know, going to the machine shop, taking your stainless steel or your Hasselhoy X or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever material you're using to con you know, to build your device. Um, and that's on order about a $5,000 project. And so if we failed, maybe not six, but certainly four or five, and that's maybe twenty-five dollars or $30,000 of you know, sort of failed paperweights that were, that, that were created. Um, the bigger cost, bigger cost for us was, uh, was the microscope objectives. And so these were long working distance objectives, long working distance objectives. And once we knew we had a design that worked, the rocket, right, this, the cylindrical thing, the biggest challenge we faced was keeping the microscope objective cool. And we lost a couple of, micro, of the long work of these microscope objectives, again, on the order of maybe two or $3,000 per objective. I mean, those were bad days. Uh, and so, you know, when all was said and done, we probably invested $50,000, if I'm liberal with it, uh, in strategies that didn't work. 
But then we came up with this, and one of the and we, we finally came up with a design that did work. It gets better with each graduate student um, who comes up with some new way to operate hotter, but keep the objective cooler, to have better spatialism. I mean, it, it gets better and better. And so I think the payoff, you know, we had three years of, of catastrophic failure. We've had seven years of pretty good success. Um, and so that's, if you, spread, if you spread that out, not so bad. The other uh, nice thing about this is that you know, some of those collaborations with the Danish Technical University with uh, the with, um, uh, University of Calgary, those collaborations have emerged because those folks are some of the best in the world at the University of Calgary and DTU, uh, making materials and doing electrochemistry, but the mechanisms lack insight, the models lack in the insight. And so they have been coming, they've been coming to us to say, can you do these measurements? And they've been coming for, people come for a month at a time. Uh, and we work with them to do measurements to try and validate or invalidate some of the mechanisms that they've developed. Uh, and so it's really a—it's really an asset now, and I'm fortunate, fortunate, fortunate to be a part of it. Do you have to operate at these high temperatures to get the chemistry to work? Is that uh... well? You, you operate at these high temperatures for two reasons. One is that the activation of molecular oxygen to make those oxide anions the first start. That you know, the oxygen oxygen double bond is, is a strong bond. It's, it's you know, by itself, it's, well, it's 485 kilojoules per mole. I mean, that's that double bond. Uh, catalyst will bring down the activation energy some, but it's, a, it's an activated process, and so you need to get high enough temperature to, to get that to go. The other reason you have to work these high temperatures is because if you don't work at those high temperatures, you get the oxide flux through the electrolyte shuts off, and so you can't draw any current. Uh, and, that's, and it's an exponential dependence. It's a e, it's a bolt, it's an e to the minus e a over r t dependence of oxide flux through the electrolyte. And so, if you drop the temperature by 50 degrees, your current might drop by an order of magnitude. And if your current drops by an order of magnitude, your power drops by an order of magnitude. So, do you do you supply that high temperature uh, from a separate source, or is it so? So commercial commercial solid oxide fuel cells, and there and there there are commercial markets. I mean, Siemens Westinghouse has has gotten out of the game, but there are others taking their place. Um, commercial SOFCs will typically bleed off a percent or so of the incident fuel fee and burn it, and then use the exothermicity and insulation to get you up to temperature. And so your efficiency takes a bit of a hit there because you're just because you're just burning some of the fuel. Uh, you're, you're, uh, to, you, to get you up to temperature with good insulation, with clever designs. 1% uh, of the fuel, you burn that, take advantage of the exothermicity, and that gets, that gets you up to and maintains temperature. And so uh, yeah, and, and so that's how, that's how you get to heat. What we do here, we have an electrical furnace, right? This is this is not a prototype SOFC that's going to be supplying you know, the naval fleet of under, unmanned underwater vehicles. Uh, we're focused more on the mechanisms. And looking at how those transfer to uh, to devices out there in the field, uh, you know the name, the, the a submarine or a carrier also will not be out there with a Raman microscope, but they will have a voltmeter. And so, if we know from the lab that a you know that a change in voltage of this corresponds to this sort of mechanism you know, occurring in in the device, uh, we can develop and we have been developing protocols then. Uh, Again, state, windows of stable control is, 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 is what this is about. Uh, earlier in the presentation, you showed a table of the NOx and SOx emissions. So did that include heating up the process to 800 degrees C? That, uh, those numbers, okay, so those, I mean, those are seen as Westinghouse numbers, and they make fuel cells. And so those numbers, I believe, Okay, I don't know, but I believe those numbers were for the total operation of the fuel cell, which means it would include the one percent burning of hydrogen or natural gas. And so that's what, I mean, and that's where the that's where the NOx of the SOx would be coming from. from would be coming from that one from that one percent burn. So, but that's that's only that's only me trusting that the people report them are honest. Um, so that's like. Um, has anybody ever dissected one of the those fuel cells to look at nickel migration through, and maybe that part of the reason why they shut? Um, so the so in these ceramic metallic 
composites, these thermits. Now, the grain sizes are about a micron. And so centering or ripening you know, on, on that scale is, you know, the short answer is, people. yes, people have looked. And while there can be material migration, it's actually not the thermal piece that drives much of the migration. In fact, what's driving a lot of the, any migration that does happen, um, and it's not so much the nickel, but any migration that does happen is usually driven by the polarization, so it's electrochemically driven. And what polarization will do is it will drive contaminants, and in particular, silica, or silicon, is a bad actor. So silicon will go, will often preferentially go to the boundary where the solid oxide, which is your source of oxides, and your nickel, your catalyst and your electric, electrical conductor, where they meet and the gas phase fuel mixture, there, that's called the three phase boundary. And that's where all the electrochemistry happens. And so if anything species preferentially adsorbs to that boundary, then that will limit your three phase boundary and forms will start to degrade. And silicon is one of the big culprits in that. Um, another culprit is, it actually usually comes in with fuels and then sulfur. So if you're using coal, if you're using sin gas, so coal gasification, you'll always have sulfur in there and sulfur. But sulfur adsorption, while well, that kills cell performance, tends to be reversible. So once you remove this source of sulfur, the sulfur will eventually begin to desorb unless you have start to form nickel sulfide, in which case you're, you're sure of depth of water. Um, if you go to smaller particle sizes, so if you say, Ooh, you know, you know micron size nickel, that's great, but that's effectively bulk nickel. If you go to, because it's got the N-A-N-O word in it, you know, nano nickel, uh, that must be much better because anything nano is better, uh, ostensibly. Because nanoparticles will center and they will ripen and you'll see significant mass migration and our mass transfer and you'll see growth of larger particles at the expense of smaller particles and that will show up in there's this really cool ex situ a technique now uh tomography so three-dimensional tomography and so what will happen is these you'll you know folks folks in northwestern folks again at imperial uh maryland too will dissect or take a small uh, 10 micron by 10 micron cube, 10 micron by 10 micron by 10 micron cube of the anode material and start to image it. And then they will, uh, through ion etching, or ion, yeah, etching really, um, they will start to just shave off layer after layer of the an of the of that cube of the anode material, and they will get a three-dimensional reconstruction of what that anode looks like. They can do it before, they do it after, and they can see how this porosity has begun to change and how the grain sizes have changed. Um, and so that's uh, that's a lot of insight comes out of that. Again, it's ex situ. You are you only know after the fact what's you know what what has happened. Uh, if not, I'll echo that again. Thanks. Um, I'll stick around and ask, answer questions too if people are shy and reserved. So uh, Yeah. 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 Yeah.